All right. We are here live. Hey, everybody. Coach Dan Fitzgerald here. I am the founder, uh, co-founder of Heartbreak Hill Running Company and founder of the Heartbreakers Running Club here for Coach Live Q&A. Heartbreakers are used to this as a benefit of Heartbreaker membership. Uh, this one is a very special night. We didn't keep this one just to members since we have an epic guest who's joining us. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Bowerman Track Club. That's why you're logging in so quickly. So we have Bowerman Track Club founder and head coach, Jerry Schumacher, stepping in here in just a moment. He is, if you've ever heard of, uh, Chris Selinski, Matt Tegenkamp, Shalane Flanagan, Emily Infeld, Colleen Quigley, Mario Hall, Mohamed, Central's over there now, Evan Jager. If you've heard of any of these runners and you followed their careers, the person behind those medals, the coach, is Jerry Schumacher. So, whoops, technical difficulties here. Uh, whoops. Sorry, guys. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I see you, Jerry. There he is. There he is. <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey, Dan. Hey, Jerry. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. It's nice to see you. Same here. Um, so thank you so much for, um, I think you may want to flip your screen there. You're showing up sideways for me. I'm, okay. I'm showing up sideways for you. Let me see. There we go. Ah, okay. Let me see how I can do that. Um, okay. Um, hold on one second here. You look good. <laughs> okay. Um, let me do this. Um, let me try this. I gotta try to get my phone to sit up here. Um, I can say I had my um, I, I had a fountain of youth question for you, Jerry. But you're growing out the beard. You're uh, you're, you're you're hiding behind the. I got a gray beard show in there. Hey, it's really great. Let me tell you, this is there's no fountain of youth going on here either. If, uh, <laughs> if I could be honest with you, I wish I wish there was, but uh, I seem to feel my age every day. <laughs> well, let's jump into it. Um, you know, I, we can talk about the current moment to kick things off. I, you know, I'm I'm here in Boston. I'm at mile 20 of, of the Boston Marathon course, and yeah. Um, at the end of February, I left Boston to go down and watch the Olympic marathon trials. And it's a very rare weekend uh, or a day that one goes to the Olympic trials of the marathon and has some FOMO uh, from race action happening in his hometown. Uh, but that's, <laughs> that was the scenario uniquely that weekend where Bowerman Track Club came down from altitude and basically lit up the track at BU in a way that uh, really put if everyone wasn't already on notice, certainly in an Olympic year, uh, people were paying close attention. And, and what went down that night, you had uh, Carissa get the American record, you had Shelby and Colleen, both under the previous American record by your other athlete, Shalane. Uh, we had Kate Grace at the fifth fastest thousand meters of all time, uh, the facility record at the world's fastest indoor track. Uh, we had, what else? We had Ryan Hill, Evan Lopez, Grant Fisher, all under 740. Uh, Lopez doubled back 10 minutes later and after that 3K uh, to run to lead 1100 meters of a 1500 that went to 334. I mean, it was a very clear signal, at least to me, I'm sure it felt the same way to other people that if you want to get to the Olympics uh, in the United States, you got to get through Barman Track Club. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how the team was feeling and, and, and that weekend in particular? Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, part of our setup, I think that indoor season, um, was going to be kind of culminating with, um, a big, big performances in Boston. And we kind of had talked about it early on and, and had set that up as kind of our, our general plan. 
And, um, you know, we did, we did our typical uh, winter training that we would normally do. We went up to altitude and dropped back down and ran a few races, including the U.S. championships. And then uh, obviously that weekend came along and uh, it was, uh, it, it, you know, it, I, I thought everyone was going to run well. There's a reason why we set things up to be fast the way that we did. Um, yeah. but it was just, it was, it was more of a step for us, I think in terms of, uh, you know, moving through the, uh, Olympic year and, and, um, I'd like to think that, uh, we had better running days ahead of us and, and in us, um, <laughs> and, uh, we're probably not going to get to showcase that this, uh, this particular year, but, uh, I think the athletes know that, that it's in them, they know it's there and we'll get back to work. We'll navigate these kind of uh you know difficult times the way we need to and then uh when when it's when we're able to we'll we'll you know kind of put that shine back on them again so yeah yeah i think a couple of noteworthy things obviously for you guys it is it's clearly it's you're the man with the plan this isn't your first go around too you know that uh it's not like you guys accidentally peaked early that was just a small window into what's been going on and what has what is yet to come um, so I think it, the excitement was just so high after that weekend. And obviously we know uh, we're meeting virtually here. Uh, a lot has changed. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you're telling your athletes now and, and, and uh, what, what, what's going on just in the moment for them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, obviously everyone's probably in a little bit different place throughout the country, depending on where you live, uh, what's available, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, you know, we're just kind of holding down the fort right now. Um, athletes are, uh, it, it, they mostly meet in pairs. Um, they'll do some running together and, 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 you know, an occasional workout together, but it's, it's not quite the same. Uh, you know, they, um, for me being an online coach is not, it's not how I like to work with athletes. Obviously we, we do what <laughs> we have to do. I mean, they, if they're uh, if they've logged in to watch this at all, this is the first time they're probably seeing me in uh, I don't know six weeks. So, <laughs> um, so they're probably shocked by the beard too. Um, <laughs> but maybe not. Maybe not. Uh, maybe by how much white is in there. But um, you know, so we've we've done what we could and what we can do. And um, I, I think you know, based on the feedback I'm getting, it sounds like you know we've maintained some pretty good fitness. Um, again, it's not been a perfect, you know, situation, but it hasn't been for anybody. And, and like I said, um, whenever we're kind of really free to get after things again, we'll find a way to put the finishing touches on, on everything. And uh, they're such a great group. They're highly motivated. They're hardworking. They're disciplined. Uh, it, it really makes my job that much easier. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that whatever we can do, we will do. And then um you know when we can get back to uh normal uh we will yeah i think one of the things you just mentioned is it's such a great group i think um what really comes through i mean you can we can talk about that bu that bu meet as an example of it but i mean you, you see it at every time the bob and track club shows up together to something they're really together you know there's an incredible amount of support that, and love that you can see between them for each other uh and their performances and their willingness to double back and help each other uh, and, and, and how hard they're cheering for their teammates. Uh, we see it on Instagram. Uh, there's really a, a culture of love and team and, and support that, that we see. Um, you know, can you talk a little bit about how you help foster that? I'm, uh, I, I don't know you well or, or at all, but I can guess you're a guy that's not going to take much credit for that. But uh, as the guy on top, how do you help foster that and, and um, keep it alive? Well, I, I think that, I mean, the credit definitely goes to the athletes for that. They're, it's a very selfless group. Uh, right. They are just, um, you know, I think one of the concepts that I've always believed in is maybe it's where, because where I started as, you know, a collegiate coach, um, the team concept has always been a big part of, of everything I've done. And I think we kind of brought, um, because the, the very early group was really, a large percent, I mean, a large group of them were really Wisconsin, the Wisconsin graduates. There was, you know, mm -hmm. Tim Nelson, Simon Byru, Chris Zielinski, uh, Matt Tegenkamp, uh, Jonathan Riley, who was a graduate of Stanford, who was actually living in Madison, um, was part of that initial group and team. Uh, and then obviously a young Evan Jagger, who was um, a very much a rookie, um, but, but had some great, uh, great mentors in uh, some of those, those graduates from Wisconsin at the time. 
And I, I think they just, they grew up on that team situation and they brought that to their professional training. And uh, every time someone has joined the team and been a part of that, again, it's been, you know, it's hard to find, uh, you know, people you, you know, it's fine to hard a bad nut to hard to find a bad nut in the running world, I feel like. And so every athlete we've had has been pretty darn, they've been great people. And so it's been really easy. So, you know, again, that, that selflessness that they have and that willingness to work for each other and to help each other out and, and help them achieve, uh, you know, their dreams and goals. I think everyone finds it just as rewarding when, I mean, don't get me wrong. Everybody wants to be, you know, on top and, and be that person who either makes the Olympic team or sets the American record and so forth. But I think they know that if they stick with it and they work really hard, um, every dog has his day and, yeah. and, um, you know, it's, it's just part of, you could call it paying dues. You could, you know, paying it forward. Uh, it, it comes in many different ways on the team, but they've all been in the position where they've needed some help to get things done. And they've got that help from teammates or, um, they provided the help. Right. And I think in both cases, uh, the athletes would say that it's very rewarding to see it happen. I mean, we can just use the that 5,000 from last uh, last fall that we did where Mo Ahmed uh, yeah. literally, I mean, he went, he went to one lap to go and in and, and, and pacing. And, and that is about as selfless as you can get yeah. in, in an effort, in a race. And just, um, you know, it, it was, it, to me was, I mean, he, he, he really – I, you know, kind of white gloved it for the, uh, <laughs> for those guys behind him, you know I mean? He just, he just let them roll right through and they were able to, uh, um, to really not worry about a thing until one lap to go. And I don't know if you get much better than that on a 5,000. So, yeah. um, but that was just one example. And, and that's right. happened over and over again. I've seen our athletes, uh, over and over again, line up and, and, uh, take on pacing duties for each other. And, and then if you were to actually witness practice as well in our practices, uh, the athletes oftentimes, uh, you know, if we're doing, and I'll just make something up here, but if we're doing 10 times a mile and there's, you know, 10 athletes in the group, they'll all trade off with, uh, I'll lead this one, I'll lead number two, I'll lead number six, I'll lead number seven. And they all trade off with leading. And, and really, uh, it's kind of nice because everybody, you know, gets their turn at the front and then everyone gets a, a bunch of time at the back. And, and, you know, the best part is I see it all the time. If, if an athlete is kind of struggling right. a little bit near the end of the workout, they're just having a, a harder day or a rougher day than uh, some of the other ones, uh, someone will step up who's already led one and said, you know what? Yeah, hey, I'm feeling pretty good. I can, I can do it. I, I'll take the lead on this one and I'll do it. And so they step up and, and they're willing to lead if one of their teammates is maybe having a harder time with it. So it's really, it's a, it's a great group. I'm just really fortunate to have, uh, uh, I think, good people on our team. And, and it really shows, I think, in, in everything they do. Yeah, I think um, I, I, there are probably a thousand notes on that 10 by mile uh yeah. a sample workout that's one of jerry's workouts uh let's talk a little bit about coaching philosophy um you're famously uh hard to find on on the internet we have a, a good sleuth here and and our uh, connor cashin who was able to find three pictures where you're the focus you're they're great professional shots for a promo <laughs> uh, and some people reached out and said where'd you find these that's, that's, our guys are good um yeah. but you know you do have your name in front of uh one of the most talked about um styles of of running the jerry miles uh you know we see that uh so you're in a lot of instagram posts in in uh in in spirit and in, in name was as jerry miles can you talk a lot a little bit about um what jerry miles are whether you developed them uh i've heard them referred to as badger miles you mentioned obviously your wisconsin days as a athlete and coach and um can you just give us the lowdown on, on jerry miles why they're important and when you do them Sure. Uh, so I, it, really the mileage system is just a way of, of kind of counting or, or adding up training. And um, it, it kind of started back at Wisconsin. So when I was a student, student athlete at Wisconsin myself, um, we had kind of these different levels of running. And um, I kind of felt like, uh, you know what, even if I ran faster than you know, uh, we, we did it at, you know, seven, it would be seven thirty to eight minute pace would be level one. And then, you know, seven thirty to, or seven to seven thirty would be level two and six thirty to seven would be level three. And we'd have to write down the levels and so forth, but I never really ever went faster than seven minute pace ever. And we just, 
we just started using that as our base. Mark. Even if we ran faster, we still counted the run at seven minute pace. So if we ran, right. you know, 50 minutes, it was seven miles. And so when I became a coach, I just, I started looking at things and I knew athletes would run faster and harder, but I didn't think that was as important. I didn't think the, the, the actual mileage was important because two people might run together and they might run the exact same run mm -hmm. and one might count it as eight miles and one might count it as seven miles. And I'm actually getting different feedback from the athletes that way. So instead I thought it was better if I, all the feedback I got was based on minutes and you could equate minutes to mileage. And it's easy for me to look at a number. It's better than seeing, you know, I ran 10,000 minutes or whatever it might be. It was easier to see, Oh, I ran 70 miles this week. And, right. and so, um, essentially it became a minute based system that was equated to mileage, which told me that anyone who ran 70 miles, if any, if, if anyone ran 70 miles for the week, it told me that if two people ran 70 miles for the week, it told me they ran the same amount of minutes for the week. And if someone ran 77 miles for the week, I knew they ran an extra 50 minutes that week right. because then those people that ran 70 miles. So it just gave me a, 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 a metric in minutes. And, but it was easier to look at a, at a small number like mileage and everyone likes to add it up as mileage. So I started having all the athletes just, you know, the men count everything as seven minute pace. The women really get ripped off and they count everything as eight minute pace. Um, <laughs> and, and, and they tell me that all the time. So, um, but the men, the men will say they get ripped off as well. So, um, <laughs> so, so essentially, you know, everyone's getting ripped off in this system on their, on their mile their mileage, <laughs> yeah. but um, essentially it's, it's really providing a minute based metric for me to look at and know how much everybody's been training throughout the week. So are Jerry miles useless if Jerry's not evaluating them? <laughs> well, first of all, I don't know why they're called Jerry miles. I, I think, I think maybe it's because it started out as badger miles because it was Wisconsin thing. And then <laughs> athletes from other schools didn't want to call them badger miles because, you know, we, we've got Seminoles and Cardinal and, you know, right. we got all the athletes from all over the lumberjacks. And so we've got athletes coming from all over the place that, and they don't want to, they don't want to reference anything as badgers because, you know, that wasn't their place. So I think it became Jerry miles, but um, we'll, we'll live with that. <laughs> uh, I remember one of the, I, I had brain farted. Shalane had uh, posted a picture of her log a couple of years back. And I remember looking at the mileage on the easy days and just, you know, looking at it. And, and I texted coach Bennett and I said, is Shalane really running all of these miles at eight minute pace? I don't think Shalane could even run eight minute pace if she tried. I'd be shocked if she could do that. <laughs> uh, just, I can't imagine. Uh, Dan, you're not making things badger miles. <laughs> Dan, you're not making things. You're not making things better for me here. Like, <laughs> I'm going to get more complaints at practice now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about Shalane a second as the uh, original barman babe. Uh, there was that New York Times article last year. Um, you may have seen just about the Shalane effect, they called it, and yeah. um, the, the level of excellence she brought as, as, uh, as the person she is uh, and elevating the other women around her and, and the team at large. Um, can you talk about um, her specifically in that culture and then how it feels to have uh, her as a co-coach now? Uh, yeah, so, so the Shalane effect was definitely, that, that's a real thing. I mean, and you know, I think you see a lot of great athletes do this, especially in team sports. Uh, athletes really tend to be able, like good athletes really help elevate the game of the others around them. And it, it takes a, uh, you know, a highly competitive, motivated, driven, selfless uh, athlete to be able to do that because you can't always be the one with the ball in your hands. And, and I think Shalane kind of fit all of those characteristics. And, and she was obviously extremely talented and a great athlete on, on her own, but it brought her a, a, a lot of, uh, I think, joy and, and just uh, a sense of accomplishment when others around her uh, performed at a high level. And she knew that, hey, I can, I can help athletes, even, even if it's you know, to my detriment, I can help athletes uh, become better and make teams and, and help them become better athletes. And, and, and most of the time, I think she would argue that it was never to her detriment, it always made her better. Right. And, and I think, and I, and I think that's really the, the case. I, I think if people are objective about it, uh, and again, again, not just in running, but in all sports, right. um, if, if you can find a way to help improve the athletes around you, you're probably making yourself better and you don't maybe see those small little things, but you are. And, 
um, you know, again, it was a very real thing. If you were to look at the athletes that, um, you know, that's centered around Shalane and everything that in, in her career and that trained with her and worked with her, uh, it, it's an incredible group and their accomplishments are outstanding. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's great to see. And then, you know, she did that as an athlete. And, you know, I knew this day was coming that I knew the day would come eventually where she would retire. And uh, that was, you know, that's the, the hardest part for, I think, any athlete. Um, you know, you can continue to be an athlete, you know, for a long time in your life, you know, just about, you know, you know, right. a long time, a long time. Right. <laughs> at the various levels, at this particular level, though, there is a, a shelf life to this level. And right. we, knew, we knew that was going to happen at some point. But, uh, you know, Shalane's been such a great ambassador for Nike and, and, and a great ambassador for the sport. Uh, it, it would be crazy not to, um, you know, have her in the sport. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, it was it, Shalane actually came to me with this idea, um, thinking that, hey, at some point, I would really like to do this. I really enjoy our team. I like being around them. I love helping out. Um, if there's any way that I can help, you know, be a part of this. And of course, um, so there were some conversations with Nike and, and Nike was, they loved the idea that they were fully on board with it. And it was just a matter as to when it would eventually happen. And nobody really knew that because, um, you know, that the ball was in Shalane's hands. It was in her court for that. And, and, right. and so we just proceeded, you know, with, Hey, we're training as a high level professional athlete. And then, um, when the day comes and you're going to take a step back from that, um, there's a new role for you. And whenever that is, we'll, you know, welcome it with open arms. And, and again, I think she's been fantastic. And, and again, not just as an athlete and a role model on the team, but now in her coaching role, she's, she's been great. Cool. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the occasions for, for our chat is the, the new, uh, the Nike Pegasus, uh, 37 recently came out, which is a favorite uh, among the Heartbreakers. It's you see it on the feet of a lot of your athletes. Oh yeah, it's a favorite uh, could you talk team. about um, just when your athletes are wearing a standard trainer, and then how many different uh, pairs of shoes they might be in during the week? You know, how many? How often are they switching into the next percent? Are they doing all their track intervals and spikes? Uh, how how do you use footwear as a tool uh, from a coaching standpoint? Sure. So uh, obviously, we're very fortunate to be associated with Nike. Uh, so the athletes are never in need of uh, a type of shoe right. uh, for the various types of training that we might be doing on any particular given day. Uh, the Nike Pegasus, as you pointed out, is definitely a favorite amongst our team because uh, the majority of the time, that's our, our training run shoe. So that's a, a recovery day shoe. It's an everyday shoe. Uh, warm up shoe. Uh, they'll wear that for if an athlete is running 100 miles a week, they'll run that for the majority of those miles throughout the week. Um, so that'll be their kind of their their main daily shoe. And and again, a large majority of our team wears the Pegasus, and it's just been it's been a favorite, and it's probably why it's been around so ever in 37 iterations. Right. And you know, <laughs> so um, so no doubt about it, it's a great shoe. But on any other given day, depending on if we're working out on the grass, we might use something that the athletes call a splat, which is a, a flat that's been converted over with a spike plate on the front mm. um, to prevent the slipping and the, maybe the muddy conditions that we may see in Oregon and working out on, on okay. real grass. Um, if we're on the track, they may use flats. They may use uh, the next percents. They may use the, uh, you know, spikes. Um, it, it just depends on the type of workout and what we may be doing. Um, and again, if we're doing a, a long road run, uh, you know, a long run and we're, we're heading out and we're doing, it'll be, you know, 20 miles on the roads on a particular day. Um, you know, that'll be a different type of shoe. And again, I don't dictate what shoes a particular athlete needs to wear. They have, um, you know, a history with shoes that they like and that really work for them and that they feel really comfortable in. And they kind of rotate through those based on the workouts that we're doing. Mm -hmm. And although a lot of athletes are, there's a lot of overlap. There are some athletes that, Hey, I just, I love wearing this one. We're, you know, on the turf or on the grass. Right. And, and I love this shoe on the roads and they may be the only person in one type of shoe. And, you know, the rest of the team might be in another shoe, but we, we do have an array of different shoes that we go through and use. 
And um, it's just, you know, it just makes the, I think the training that much more fun, especially, you know, a lot of times they'll pull out and, hey, I get to put my spikes on today or, right. or I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm wearing this today. I'm wearing that today. And they, they enjoy doing that. So, um, so we do rotate through a lot of different shoes. My, the athletes will tell you that my message uh, to them the night before is always, uh, you know, giving workout times and instructions and warm up and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, training groups or whatever. And often it says, uh, please bring all appropriate footwear <laughs> because, <laughs> because, you know, a lot of times, you know, an athlete comes in and it's like, Oh, I didn't think we were doing that today. So I didn't bring these. And, and so I started adding that to my, to my, you know, my, my messages to them the night before the, the workouts. And, uh, uh, it's now become kind of, I think a running joke. Cause I hear athletes say that all the time. So I'm, I'm sure they're making fun of me behind closed doors, which is okay. I, I'm, I, I can deal with that, but, um, hey, that's, sure that's, that's just good coaching. That's, yes. that's, that's coach's coach. <laughs> told you to bring all your shoes. Don't tell me you don't have the shoe that you need right now. Don't tell me you don't, you don't have, I will say this though. You know, there was one time, uh, before, uh, it was before the Boston marathon and, and it was Shlaine was running. And she showed up at the track. And I think I said, you know, the usual, bring all appropriate footwear and, you know, be prepared for, um, you know, we probably want to do this one in, um, you know, the, the shoe that you're going to be wearing. And I, I'm not even kidding. She showed up with like eight different pairs of shoes. And I was like, I was really confused. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, you haven't decided on, she's like, no, no, they're all very similar. I'm just trying to decide on the color now. And I was uh -huh. like, oh. <laughs> So, so color did matter um, in, in, in the preparing for the, the, the big race. So, um, which is, which is great. <laughs> hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta look fly if you want to fly, right? I, I you know what? I, and I've heard that many times in, in, in my own little camp here, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, look good, feel good and, and run, run good or something. Yeah. <laughs> something like that. <laughs> All right. No English teachers are here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Um, could you talk about, uh, say we're in the, the heat of the season or, or early season, what's, what's a week of uh, a barman and track club athlete look like uh, in terms of, you know, um, workout density? Are they working out twice a week? Are they, how, how often are they going to the gym? How many of the runs are they doing? Uh, yeah. You know, what's, what's, a, what's a typical week look like for a BTC athlete? So we have a, a, a system that, eh, you know, I say it changes, you know, uh, quite a bit depending on the time of year. So sometimes I'll, we'll have a seven day cycle where, and the cycle always ends, that cycle will end with a long run. So um, sometimes we'll do seven days, sometimes we'll do 10 days, sometimes we'll do 12 days. And so in times of the year where the long runs just not as important, it may be spaced out 12 days and then there'll be workouts scattered within those in, in between those other 11 days there'll be a cycle of workouts and sometimes it might be over 10 days sometimes it might be over seven days it's always easiest to kind of describe maybe what seven days looks like um because it's just more simple and it's based on a on a week <laughs> so so you know if i was to, to say kind of what our training cycle may look like it'll be a long run on sunday let's say right. uh, or let's start with monday as, as being the first day of the week and and monday may be a, a recovery day and then tuesday may be uh, a workout day and then Wednesday, Thursday, maybe recovery, Friday, maybe a workout day, Saturday recovery, Sunday long run. So you essentially see there'll be two workouts in there Tuesday and Friday with a long run that can kind of double back either as um, kind of more of a how you feel kind of day for a long run, or it could be kind of a more structured uh, effort depending on what we want to get after and what we want to get out of that long run or even out of the week based on the week. And if the week wasn't as high a quality, a lot of moderate, running workouts, then the long run can have a little bit of bite to it. And if it was a high quality week and we had good training, um, for whatever reason, really, you know, we just really, uh, got after it a little bit, then the long run will take a step back and just be a little bit easier. Yeah. Um, Marielle Hall mentioned when we, uh, host, hosted her at the, uh, at one of our Chicago events for Chicago marathon weekend, uh, that within your workouts, you, um, you have three different uh, goals, uh, pace workouts, speed workouts, and strength workouts. Um, could you give us some examples of those? Maybe one example of each and, and don't water it down for, for the audience. Kill them <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I, I can definitely do that. Um, so, uh, and again, a lot of it depends on the time of year. Uh, you know, some in the fall, it's, it's a lot of general training and a lot of, uh, uh, what I would call kind of, 
uh, massage work until we're ready. It's, it's fitness work. It's fitness building and, and um, conditioning work and just getting us ready for that really, you know, that hard kick in the pants type of stuff that we get to during the more competitive times of year. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if I was to describe a strength workout, uh, you know, for us, a strength workout will be probably um, either a, 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 it'll be long intervals um, with short recovery. Maybe it'll be five times a two mile with 90 seconds rest. Um, maybe it's four times a two mile, but it'll be a set of volume. And depending on the athlete, they may run anywhere between six and 10 miles worth of work. Um, very short recovery. And, you know, we'll, we'll pick a pace that we think is appropriate for that workout and that time of year and try to maximize you know the amount we get out of now we don't want to we don't want that session to necessarily crush them mm -hmm. and so that they're you know they're they don't they can't do another workout the rest of the week so it'll be just dialed back enough but enough where um, they get that stimulus that we're looking for and also doesn't put them over over the edge for the rest of the week or even for the entire training block Right. And then, um, and so, and that can change throughout the seasons. Like I said, that can change. It, even if we still do that workout during the competitive time of year, it may get more watered down so that we really have the emphasis on a different type of workout. But in the fall, that strength workout is our most important one. So we get after that one a little bit more in the fall and winter than we, than we do during maybe the highly competitive times of the year. And then yeah. um, uh, the other workout would be kind of a, uh, a speed session. Um, you know, we don't ever want to stray too far from it, but we also, uh, you know, it's, it's not in the fall, you know, being able to rip, you know, fast hundreds and two hundreds really isn't the most important thing for us when, um, you know, in the summertime is when we want to be kind of maximizing that. But at the same time, we don't want to avoid it and say, Oh, since it's not important, we're not going to do it at all. So right. we just touch base with that a little bit again. And uh, we do a little bit of work like that. And again, it's, it's more watered down perhaps in the fall than it will be in the spring, just vice versa to the strength workout where the strength workout is more watered down in the spring than right. it is in the fall. But um, you know, it'll, it'll be something that we always want to kind of keep close to us and, and do. And, and those speed workouts can, can vary. They can be um, you know, we'll try to have um, some really high intense, you know, maybe a couple 400s and then some, some high end one fifties and maybe a couple more four hundreds, something like that. And the thing that I definitely do is we don't do a lot of, we mix a lot of the workouts up. Like, again, I don't think there's any magic in the specific workout we do. Uh, it's, it's, I mean, it could be hard hundreds with, you know, three hundreds. It could be a set of just three hundreds. It could be a set of just four hundreds or just two hundreds, or it could be a mix of everything. And it could be 400, 300, 200, 100 times two. Right. <laughs> it could be, it's a huge mixed bag of things. And we try to keep it fresh and really keep it, um, and, uh, you know, fun for the athletes. It's like, oh, I haven't done this before. Or if I did it, I did it a couple of years ago. Or um, I, I really don't look back and I don't try to design right. the season around what we've done in the past. Um, I try to keep it where I'm in tune with what the athletes are doing and what they're capable of doing and kind of watching them and how they handle it and how they perform. And it kind of dictates what we may do the following week as well. But that would be kind of like our speed type of session. And then um, our specific work is just designed around uh, that's really in those competitive times of year. And it depends on the athlete and it depends on the event they're running. And, um, you know, specific work could be, uh, you know, like for a 5,000 meter runner might be four times a 1200 and we'll do it at, at race pace and, you know, take a, you know, a three minute inter, a three minute break or something. And, and we'll do that as well, but that, that doesn't, we really don't get into that real specific work um, except for a couple times a year, like yeah. during the competitive times when we really, we got to, we need to do that work. And um, you know, a lot of times athletes will probably race more than our club does. And they get that, they, a lot of the athletes will get that specific work in from, from racing um we'll t a lot of times get it in just in those workouts and and we have the the kind of the meat and potatoes of a crew to get it done so it, it practices can sometimes feel i mean a lot of times i've had athletes say man those workouts are harder than the races <laughs> so um so we, we we get the work in that maybe other athletes are getting in from free, more frequent racing um, and for whatever reason, it's just not working into our calendar or how we're training or our altitude camp or whatever it might be. It's just not working in and we can't get away for the race. So we'll get it in through training. Yeah. How, uh, how important is strength training in your group? You know, you have a strong looking group. Certainly they don't look like a group that uh, misses 
this is the weight room or 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 as uh you know looking to be skinny fast they they look yeah. strong fast uh and um can you talk about the importance of weight training and everyone always wants to know do they do it before they run after they run you know how many times a week are they in the gym are they lifting heavy uh and and just generally what does weight yeah. training mean to btc mm -hmm we our strength coach and and one of our coaches the guy who's in charge of the strength i should say but he's also a big part of everything we do in our club is pascal dobert and uh pascal was uh an old teammate of mine at wisconsin and um uh he uh he was a 2000 olympian in the steeplechase he actually won the olympic trials in 2000 he was he was a great steeplechaser for america three-time u.s champion uh, NCAA champion. I mean, he was just, he was a great runner when we were there. And mm -hmm. um, Pascal and I, I think have always really connected really well out on the athletic field. And um, during one of the, right after he retired from professional running, I was coaching at Wisconsin and he had come back and uh, uh, he knew the steeple really well. And he was really, a, 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 I think a really solid tactician when it came to hurling. And, and he also brought this uh, strength element to our team. And he started, you know, I, he kind of, kind of put him in charge of, of helping our team uh, do all of our conditioning core strength work. And the, I, I immediately noticed an impact. And when you train in Wisconsin in the wintertime, there's all slippery, icy roads. And I just yeah. noticed that we had a, we had a few more injuries always in the wintertime than we would any other time of year. Just, it was just something I came to accept because of the winter right. and so forth. And I noticed right away that not only were our injuries down, um, during the normal times of the year, but we had less injuries in the winter time too. And I don't know, I, you know, I can't probably uh, describe what it exactly is. It's just, I think our overall conditioning and fitness was better with the strength and conditioning that Pascal was having our, our Wisconsin athletes do. And it was just great stuff. So when the opportunity presented itself to have him be a part of the Bowerman staff and help the professional athletes, it was just, way too hard to pass up because here I'm getting a really experienced uh, strength and conditioning coach who knows his way around um, those elements. And then on top of that, someone who understands what a hundred mile week does to your body. He understands what 10 times a mile does to your body. So he can adjust on uh, as needed and necessary in the weight room to um, adjust for the type of training we're doing during a particular cycle, during the type of week. He's an athlete who competed at the highest level. He gets it at a, at a at, he gets running. And, right. and the fact that he gets running and, and can bring all these other strength elements to our program and team has just been an invaluable resource for us. And, and so Pascal is definitely in charge of all of that. He, he has com, you know, complete autonomy over everything we do in the weight room. He puts them in there about three times a week and um, has a very, uh, uh, I, I don't want to say it, it's a, it's a, a dynamic program that doesn't, it's never, uh, he doesn't just, uh, there's a lot of routine to some of the exercises, but they're always uh, rotating and fluctuating. And, and because you do want to continue to work on, on various areas when you go in the weight room and you want all those areas to get stronger. But at some point, um, you know, it's like, it's like anything, you, your body adapts to that stress and you got to find a way to stress it slightly differently. And that's what he has been great about doing. And he, he just, he finds a way to stress all of those, those muscle groups and everything that you wanted to be, to be strong and conditioned as an athlete, he finds a way to stress those in different ways on a continuous basis so that we're always remaining kind of strong and not And, you know, it can, it can get redundant if you just do the same thing over right. and over and over again. And he finds a way to, I think, challenge the athletes, make it fun and uh, keep it fresh at the same time. So he's, he's really been our guy then he's been, he's been phenomenal with it. That's awesome. Um, who's your favorite barman athlete uh, on Instagram? <laughs> you know, I can't, I, I can't answer that because I don't have Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any thoughts uh, on the koala challenge? <laughs> uh, wait a minute, are you doing this on purpose to me or is this, uh, uh, I, I feel like I'm in trouble. Okay. I don't even know what that is. Oh, okay, that's, that's, you don't really want to. It's one of those, it's, it, that one's a little cringy. So you don't even need to get into it. You okay. can ask your athletes. Um, who's your favorite 
athlete uh, outside of running? Outside of running? Okay. Um, outside of running. Um, that's a tough one. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if I... I enjoy watching, it's more of a profile of an athlete. And it's, it's easy to pick the superstars in any sport probably because they're so high profile and they, they seem to have those attributes. Right. But, uh, you know, those highly competitive, uh, really driven, those that you can feel the emotion coming out uh, when they're playing the game and they're doing the game. Or maybe sometimes it's after because, you know, in running you can't really show that emotion when you're – 4k into a hard 5k but right. It, right. It, it's you see it afterwards and you it and i think athletes who show that and and i really i think i connect with that a lot and i i, yeah. I feel that and i think that's what and i think that's what all of us really love because that's probably why you know some some athletes are not only they're great but they they show they exhibit those and that's why they're so media friendly and, and they're constantly um at the attention of us so i i don't know that i could just pick one but it's definitely the athletes that, that, you know, put their heart and soul into it and you feel it while they're competing or after they're competing. Yeah. And it's just, it brings out that, like, you know, that, that response that you want everyone to feel and, right. and everyone can feel that it's, it's a matter of finding a way, finding that inside yourself and, and bringing it out. But um, those athletes put it on display for us on the, on the, you know, the big screen and, and, yeah. Um, it, it, I love to see that. And, and I would say, you know, a lot of our barman athletes, I feel that from them and it really, it, it makes it really exciting to work with them because I see what they do day in and day out and all the hard work. And then when I see something really come together for, yeah. uh, one of them or a bunch of them, um, it's just, you know, it makes, it, it makes that whole journey really real. And you don't get to live the, the journey with, I guess we are with Michael Jordan right now, but right. most of the time you don't get to live that journey with those athletes. You just see them right. on that on center stage and, uh, but you can feel it still um, in, in their emotions and how they play and, 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 you know, everything that they do out on the court or on the field, you can you feel that. But with athletes in our sport and, and that I get to work with, I get to see it from them, you know, in the journey day in and day out, but also on, when they are on the big stage, and they do something really special. You can just feel that emotion in them, and 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 it makes it it makes it just it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. So um, I would say any athlete that really has that those qualities. I would I would uh, that would be a great ending. I have more questions, but that is yeah. the perfect coach. Uh, who wouldn't want to be coached by somebody who has that answer? An athlete that gives you an emotion. I think that's what makes a coach want to coach too is seeing that and, and seeing them put it out there. Um, you know, is there is there a coach in, in your life? Um, that inspired you to to want to do this and uh, you gave a great reason why looking at that wanting the guy that would be a great example but was there a coach or person who exemplified uh what you hope to be or uh yeah you know i mean so obviously i get a lot of uh training ideas and 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 uh training theory i guess from reading books of all the great coaches etc cetera, etc cetera, that have, have come before and and um i think you know, early on, I learned that there's probably not a lot of secrets in training in the sport. And there really is no reason to have secrets in training. It's more of taking things that um, there, there's kind of that, that concrete science part of training. And then there's that artistic part of, of training. And I think combining the two with, you know, the coach's personality is what I think hopefully leads to success. Um, and I think, you know, looking back in, in my life, I think, um, uh, and this is going to be a little bit longer answer than you may want, but no, it's, okay. um, it, it, it's um, you know, I had a sixth grade bat. I'm going to, there's three coaches in particular uh, because as much as I could say, like, you know, following, you know, the things that John McDonald did or Bill Bowerman, um, you know, some of these legends in the sport um, and looking, looking at what they did through reading books and so forth has been uh, very motivating and, and exciting to read about really the ones who have the most impact on you. They're probably the ones who, were in contact in your own personal life. Right. And um, so, you know, real quickly, I had a, I had a sixth grade basketball coach who, when I was in fifth grade, um, and now this is, this is Catholic league basketball. <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to keep this um, very PG of course, but um, <laughs> when we were in fifth grade, all we heard, and, and back then, I don't know if, I don't even know how it works today necessarily, but sometimes I think coaches move with their team from fifth grade to sixth grade to seventh grade to eighth grade and so forth. I think coaches keep coaching that same group all the way through. Back uh -huh. then, 
our coaches weren't like that. So the sixth grade coach was a sixth grade coach every year. And he just took a new group of kids in and coached them in sixth grade. And then they would move on to seventh grade and the, new, the fifth graders would move up to him. So right. when I was in fifth grade, the sixth graders were like, you guys are in so much trouble next year. You have no idea what it's like. Like this guy's insane and he's crazy. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, uh, uh, I, I gotta say he was, um, uh, you know, it was my first experience with, I think, um, somebody who was just flat out competitive, crazy. And, <laughs> and it, 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 I mean, it, and honestly, I, I, I think some people might have been intimidated by it and, 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 you know, maybe didn't like the experience. I don't know what it was. I loved it. Like, it, I, mean, <laughs> I, I had this guy who, I mean, you would have thought some of our halftime speeches, it was game seven of the NBA finals. And, and we were down by one. And, and, you know, it was like, I mean, the intensity in the locker room and, and how he, I mean, it was throwing clipboards and just, I mean, it was just crazy. It was craziness. And, and I'll, I'm just going to be honest, I loved every minute of it. And then, the, and the best, and the best part about it was that after the game, whether we won or lost by 20, won or lost by one, um, it was high fives around and Hey guys, there was an ice cream, you know, ice cream place about a block down the street from the, the school we played at. And it was, Hey, I got ice creams on me guys. And everyone would just walk down to the ice cream shop and he'd buy all the, all the kids on the team ice cream. And it was, we didn't even talk about the game after that. It was just talking about nonsense and, and, but practice and practice and games were, they were intense. And it was my first real experience with, I mean, this guy, I didn't think anyone would want to win more than me because I'm, I'm on the team, but this guy's like, I, he may want to win more than all of us. Like, he's insane. <laughs> and, and I loved it. And I loved it. Um, and then uh, obviously my next experience with uh, uh, a coach that uh, um, was in running and it was my high school coach. And uh, for most of us, that's probably our first experience with a running coach, I guess. Right. Um, and, and my high school coach was, um, you know, the difficult task of taking, you know, a bunch of kids who played ball sports their whole life and for whatever reason are showing up on day one for cross country, like me, you know, being five foot one and 90 pounds, <laughs> there wasn't a whole lot I was going to be able to do in high school. And, right. and you know, it, it was pretty obvious that, um, you know, I, I was probably the smallest kid in the school between the boys and the girls. So um, I was coming in really small and, and there was no way any, you know, football wasn't going to work. You know, it was not going to happen. And, um, so I showed up for cross country. Um, my parents encouraged me to do it. They're like, you know, you can run around like a crazy person all the time. And, you know, I'm sure you'll be good at running. And if you really want to play a sport and I was a really competitive kid and I really wanted to do it. So I showed up on day one. So here's a guy who, um, had all the qualities of my sixth grade basketball coach, but he had the task of trying to find a way to make running. I, how, how is he going to get this 90 pound kid to come back out tomorrow. Like if I, if right. I, you know, it, so he had to bring this, this, this uh, really personality to the game and to practice every day. So, you know, I remember my first practice and we went on around seven miles and, and I, by, you know, for someone who had never run a step really other than up and down basketball courts or soccer fields or right. whatever, um, oh. that was, that was a long way. Yeah. And, and so, and so, um, but, you know, there was something about that first day of practice and his personality that I really liked. And I showed up on day two, even though I could barely walk down the stairs. <laughs> that day, I showed up on day two and then day three and day four. And he just had he had this this unique gift to um, make uh, make running the experience of running really, really enjoyable until I found that enjoyment all by myself. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it, it does take time because yeah. let's be honest, running's hard. I mean, hard. it's tough. It's not easy. It's, it's hard. But when you find it, when you stick with it long enough, you find that love and that running for it. And then it's like, you have to pry, you have to, I mean, you would have had to pry me away from practice. I didn't want to miss practice. I, didn't, I mean, there was no way I wanted to miss practice ever. Right. And so, um, so I, I, I definitely kind of credit my high school coach for kind of bringing some of those elements to uh, maybe some of the things that, that I hopefully bring to the team. And then, of course, my college coach at Wisconsin was um, probably the biggest uh, variable because here was someone who just, you know, I was still kind of, I was really green coming in. I didn't really, I mean, to be honest with you, I entered college and I didn't know who Prefontaine was. And so yeah. I remember the first I was in a similar boat, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, 
I went to, I was, I remember sitting in practice one day and a bunch of people were talking about this guy and I, I didn't want to say anything because I was like, I don't know who they're even talking about. <laughs> and, and I mean, I don't know who this is, but they're raving about, I, I knew really nothing about the sport, but um, he had, you know, again, those, those intense qualities. Um, he wanted to win um, very competitive person, but he also knew the sport just backwards and forwards and, and his educational piece and um, the ability to kind of, kind of paint and, and, and bring into focus um, the picture, the place that we wanted to be and where we wanted to go, not only individually, but as a team, he was just masterful at that. And uh, I, I really, I feel like um, there was somewhere along the way in my collegiate journey as a student athlete that, you know, I looked over at him and said, you know, I hope one day I can do what he's doing and, and be as good as he is at doing it. And, and so um, I, I can't, I couldn't tell you exactly when it happened. Um, you know, people have asked me and, and um, I've made a, a joke out of it before where I said it was, you know, I was eight miles into a 10 mile tempo run and he was on the bike and I realized that's the job I want to have. <laughs> um, but, but in truth, it, it was more than just that, you know, it, it, it was, it was, uh, um, there was a lot of moments along the way where I realized like, you know, really, um, you know, being able to just be one of the spokes in the wheel and contributing to, um, kind of that, um, success and the, and the, the journey and the, and the emotion that we just talked about before. Um, I think really all of those things are the things that really, um, you know, those three, those three individuals kind of really, I think brought it, um, they, they bring a lot of hopefully what I bring to practice and um, inspired me to do a lot of the things the way I do them probably. So, yeah. Yeah. That's funny. And I think about uh, coaching similarly where, you know, I get, you might get the question too, you know, like people want to ask me about my running and I don't really care about my running at all right now. It's, I do it. It's what I like to do for fitness, but what really fires me up about running is coaching and being yeah. around my athletes and, and just having fun uh, that way. That's like, that's, that's the dream now, you know, it's, I'm just having fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like, you know, every dog has his day and I feel like maybe we had our day with that <laughs> and it's not going to stop us from going out and trying to right. hammer those runs out. And, right. and you know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be honest. I, I'll still tell you my favorite thing in the whole world to do before any practice starts is I love to hammer out 10 miles. If I could hammer 10 miles, it's like a great day. And, <laughs> and, and, but the fact is, it only gets better when I go to practice after that 10 mile run. And, and, but yeah. you know, again, it's, it's not about, um, it's not about, uh, uh, again, I think the successes we've had in the past, or we try to have now, everything is relative based on where we are in our own, you know, personal journey right. with running and life, right. but there is nothing better than helping other people get from point A, point B and experience the same emotions and joy and things that we got out of running um again whatever level it is there's yeah. nothing better than that it's just right. it's just uh, that's that's the name of the game there yeah the fun thing about those hammering 10 miles one of, one of the things i find freeing is i don't need to do it responsibly anymore my running doesn't matter so you can hammer more days you can you don't have to protect anything no, Dan, no races on the line <laughs> Dan, you and i have a lot in common and, 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 you know um it's it's I don't know, you know, I, unfortunately I'm to the point where my age, it, it's working against me now, this, this strategy of mine where I feel like I can do whatever I want to do with it. I can, I mean, and, and, you know, more times than not, I err because I just say, I, I don't have to be responsible. I can run as hard as I want. And the next day is really disastrous. And then I hammer again. And eventually, I mean, what, what, what really is bad about it though, is I get myself into so much trouble um, it's, it's not a, it's not a good thing. And, and my team will just, they'll just shake their head about it because they see me limping around most of the time. And I'm just, it's, it's, it's really, you know, as a coach, it's always do as I say, not as I do. So well, <laughs> I'm going to say next time people bring up Jerry miles, I'm going to say, I don't do Jerry miles. I run like Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, it, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> All right, I got a couple of uh, fun questions to finish us sure. off here. Sure. Uh, what's your favorite recipe from Run Fast, Eat Slow or Run Fast, Cook Fast, Eat Slow? Uh, well, my, my uh, you know, I, okay, my newest, 
my new one. So my, my family definitely cooks from the book all the time. My, my daughter is, uh, I, I think she's in her freshman year of college and I think she and her uh, roommates do, you know, I, I think they religiously cook from the book. Um, I gotta be honest. My favorite thing is um, something that's new that's coming out um, that I got to kind of taste test. And it's, a, oh. it's, uh-huh, it's this, it's this muffin. So um, I don't know if I'm allowed to even like, Oh, you know, say anything about it, but there, there's this, this is, muffin and it's got uh, lemon and, and poppy seed in it. And um, it's it's really, really good. And and there's also another special muffin that's in there that I really like, but I'm not going to talk about that one. Um, but this one in particular um, <laughs> is is really, really tasty. And um, I, again, I don't know how much I can say or shouldn't be saying, but uh, um, <laughs> I, I got to taste test a, t a few of these things. And then I don't know how my daughter got the uh, recipe from Shalane, but she did. And uh, she made them here at home and uh, they're, they're really good. So um, that's probably my favorite thing that I've had out of all the recipes. So I'm, sh I'm sure you know that uh, the, the feet of your athletes uh, get out there on the internet pretty often for their top secret uh, shoes that they're flying around in practice or on world-class meets. And now uh, you're going to be the target of food blog, uh, secret rumors of <laughs> secret recipes. So you just, you got a whole new corner of the internet alike, Jerry. <laughs> I got a question here from a young man named Chris Derrick. What brings you more joy watching the team fly on the track uh, in summer practices when they're super fit or watching them suffer and fall season grass sessions? Uh, you know, this would be, uh, if this is the Chris Derrick, I think it is. It's that uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, is, there is a real sense of satisfaction to those soul crushing, long strength workouts that we do in the fall when I can just, I can just feel the fitness building and building and building. Um, and, and those can sometimes get really ugly. And, and I'm aware of that there is something very uh, satisfying in that, but I'll be honest, there might not be anything like a finely tuned machine and yeah. watching it float and execute, um, you know, uh, at its highest level. Um, there's just something beautiful about that. And, and I, I would probably take that um, despite uh, enjoying the, the process of getting to that point, I would probably take that really, really highly tuned instrument and just, you know, listening to it. It's, it's, and watching it, it, it go. It's, it's that there's nothing better than that, probably. Well, the clearest thing about that answer is both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, both, both. Love yeah. watching them suffer and love watching them fly. <laughs> yeah, both. I, we, we can go with that. <laughs> All right, rapid fire here uh, coffee or tea? <laughs> oh, it, it, or neither. I, I gotta be honest neither yeah all right yeah neither um i, I don't drink either <laughs> star wars or space balls <laughs> boy this i am i'm gonna be bad at this game with you uh i, I guess i'm gonna have to say neither <laughs> wow okay uh as a famous jerry jerry seinfeld or jerry springer oh jerry seinfeld okay yeah jerry jerry seinfeld for sure Fast braid Friday or French bread Friday? <laughs> you know what? I follow that a little bit because I hear the little bits and pieces of about it. But since I'm not on Instagram and I think that's, is that an Instagram thing, right? Or no? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, so I, I think, um, I don't even know if I can answer that one. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I yeah, I don't even know if I can answer that because I, I don't know enough about either of them. I think one is is doing braids on Fridays yes. to to for workouts and races and to look good, feel good type of deal. And the other one was um, kind of trolling the the fast braid and kind of that's my understanding. Yeah, having having fun with her with her teammates and and I think that got a lot of humor and a lot of laughs and and. Uh, I think it was all and I think it was all great. So I, I don't know if I, I can pick one or the other, but it sounds like they were both, you know, a lot of fun. Okay. I like that answer. Uh, last one, uh, Shelby or Centro? <laughs> uh, you know, okay. Shel <laughs> I mean, you want me to pick between athletes here. Um, let's see here. Central causes me, um, see all this gray down here? Like this? <laughs> 
<laughs> this might all be Centro. And, and Shelby causes very little stress, if any, <laughs> ever, ever. So, so um, depending on the mood, if I want high stress, I'm going to pick Centro. If, uh, if I want, uh, you know, the low stress, uh, 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 you know, day, it's, it's Shelby. Shelby is, is, you know, they're like polar opposites when it comes to that. <laughs> I guess they cut you off at an hour, guys. I just learned that bit, but that was my last question. If I see Jerry on here, then I will. Oh, there he is. He's back. Okay. I'll take it. Hey, Jerry. Hey, sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> no, it's it's clear. Uh, they only give you an hour on this thing, and I was like trying to get it an hour. That was my actual last question, but. I, I wanted to just say uh, a heartfelt thank you for uh, being on the Instagram here here with me. A couple old guys chatting, coaching. I know um, the community really appreciates it. I, there's a lot of positive feedback down there. And, um, you know, I can't help but feel all of uh, the emotion that you pour into what you do and uh, the, the joy uh, that you have for, for uh, the sport and, and your athletes is really, it's contagious and it, it, it shows through them. And, and to have you here sharing it personally, uh, is is humbling and i so appreciate it so thank you no my my pleasure dan and it was great getting to chat with you and talk with you and hopefully uh if we come back to boston in the future uh make sure you come and say hi and and hopefully you're not heading out to atlanta and, and having to miss any of that yeah i oh, i was so pissed <laughs> <laughs> thanks again jerry i really appreciate it you bet dan anytime okay